This is the first video in a series where we're going to talk about procedures in App Inventor. In this video, we're simply going to describe what a procedure is. In the next two videos, or maybe one, two, or three, we'll see how it goes, uh, we're going to demonstrate procedures, both one with a, a without a return value, that'll be our first video, and then one with a return value, that'll be our second video. So first of all, what are procedures? This is a fundamental concept in programming. Uh, they go by different terms. Uh, other programming languages might call them functions or subroutines. In Java, we typically call them methods. So a procedure wraps up a distinct unit of work that can be invoked multiple times and from multiple places. Uh, the example our book gives is pretty good. It talks about uh, go brush your teeth. You know, that's like calling a procedure you don't have to list every single step, which is open the drawer, find your toothbrush, put toothpaste on it, get it wet, so on and so forth. Instead of listing every single step, you can simply say, brush your teeth and your son or daughter or whoever uh, will know what that means. So that's essentially what a procedure is. Now, we've already been calling procedures in App Inventor. The, a lot of those blocks on the side have procedures that we can call. For example, uh, split a string, one of those text functions that we have is to split a string, and we used it before to split by the slash t. So that's a procedure because it's taking many different steps and giving it one name, a concise name that can be called over and over again. So if you think about what split the text means, it means look at every letter of this text until you find the split parameter, which would be that backslash t. As soon as you find that split parameter, then, okay, take all the text you've seen so far, make that a new text variable, put that into a list, and then repeat. So you see the concept of splitting text is something that actually involves many lower level steps that, frankly, we could write. We could write each of those lower level steps, even with the tools that exist in App Inventor. But why bother when we have a procedure that will do the work? So why do we like procedures? Well, less redundancy. And the example that we're going to take a look at in a moment is our chemistry game. And we see that we're starting to get a very long uh, series of blocks here, specifically this one that you see on the left, getting very long. So we can take the things that are redundant. Uh, for example, these two for each blocks are very similar. We can take those things that are redundant uh, and refactor them into a reusable procedure. And so that's what we're going to do. Now, there's a lot higher quality because, frankly, you're doing more with less code. And that's great. That's our goal. The less code we have, uh, the, the better we can keep control over it, the better we can test it out. So if you have only two hours for testing and you have maybe three pages of code versus one page of code, which one is going to get more thoroughly tested? And then once we have tested our procedures and we're sure that they work, we can reuse them with little to no testing because we already have proven out the concept that they work. Another thing, as I mentioned with the toothbrush example, is it hides internal details or what we'll call a black box. So brush your teeth. The details are internal to that statement. All I have to say is brush your teeth. Uh, split a string. We don't really care about the details. We just need to provide it with the text that we want to split. And then that split parameter, which in our case was the backslash t. Then the other advantage is there's reusability across applications if you build a library procedure. Now, one footnote on this, App Inventor doesn't support the creation or actually importing uh, libraries. So unfortunately, this is something that we won't be able to use in App Inventor. But don't worry, as we learn this concept and use this concept, uh, we'll be able to reapply it into something like Android Studio. So what do we need for a procedure? First, it has to have a unique name. That's how we're going to identify it. That's how we're going to call it. Secondly, it can have some parameters. In the example that we're going to do, uh, we are going to refactor our um, button guess click, which is, is very long and unwieldy. And you see that these two for each loops are identical, except for one thing, and that is are we increasing the count by one or are we decreasing the count by one? So in other words, uh, if you haven't seen the previous video, uh, what we're doing here is we have a recipe for a molecule like carbon dioxide, and then the learner will guess what 
what uh, el uh, elements go into carbon dioxide. So uh, at the first part, we are going to count up two carbons. So we're gonna invoke this twice and one oxygen. Then we're gonna subtract from that what the user has chosen. Uh, if two carbons, then minus two. If two oxygens, then minus one. And if we balance out to zero, that means we have a correct answer. So if you look at these two, number one, where we're computing what the answer is, and number two, where we are subtracting from that answer what the user has submitted, these two things are very similar, except for this one number here that we're either adding or subtracting. And so that would be a parameter. That would be we either want to add one or we want to subtract one. So we'll see more when we actually do this refactoring. Okay, um, the formal parameter is a definition of a parameter. Uh, so in, in Java, we would call that a parameter variable. But a formal parameter means when we define this procedure, these are the parameters that we are expecting to be passed into the procedure. Now, the actual parameter means when we call the procedure at runtime, what value are we passing into the procedure? We can have zero parameters coming in. We can have one. We can have a whole bunch. It doesn't matter. Any, any area in between zero to many is fine. Now, return value, we're limited to either zero return values or one return value. The return value means when we finish this procedure, is there a value that we want to return back to the, the method that called us or to the, uh, to the subroutine that called us or whoever called us. We can either return nothing or we can return one thing. We cannot return many things. Now, this is because a procedure should only really do one thing and return it. We don't want procedures to get very long. They should be very succinct. So the example that we see a lot is like compute distance. You would have maybe an XY coordinate that you pass in uh, for the starting point and an XY coordinate for the ending point. So that's up to four incoming parameters. But distance is just one value. So when you have these two XYs, then you can compute and return the distance and that's just one value. That's really what a procedure should do. It might feel like a limitation that we can only return up to one value, but it is a very important limitation because it keeps our procedures focused, and it also makes it easier to decide what to do when we hear back from a procedure. Finally, we also have to consider what work we want to do in the procedure. So we'll have a, a series of steps that go back to our original discussion of sequence, selection, iteration. All of those things are fine in a procedure. So we define the procedure, uh, and that's kind of like defining a block. We also have to call the procedure. Either we call it from another procedure, or we call it from one of our event handler blocks that we already have. But we have to keep in mind, a procedure will not be activated until it's called. It can be called zero times, which means it will never be activated. It can be called one time or multiple times. Hopefully a procedure will become, be called multiple times, because that, that means we're getting a lot of leverage off of this reusable code, and that means we've done a good job in calling this procedure, creating the procedure. If you find that you have a procedure that's only called once, uh, ask yourself, did you define the procedure to be generic enough? Did you define it to be used in multiple scenarios or only in one scenario? So those are things we need to think about. Now, don't confuse a procedure with a procedure call. So a procedure is a named block that will do the work, and then you call that procedure, you invoke that procedure from another block or from an event handler. Uh, this confuses people a lot. There's a difference between the definition of a procedure and then calling the procedure, invoking the procedure. Uh, the scenario that I often give here is it's like calling your friend. So if you call your friend, you put in your friend's phone number, that's an identifier for your friend's phone. Now, just because your friend's phone number is in your phone, maybe in your contacts list or your recently called list, that doesn't mean that your phone and your friend's phone are one and the same. The phone number is assigned to your friend's phone, just like a procedure name will be assigned to a procedure. And then calling that your friend's phone means you're putting in that number and you're hitting call. It doesn't mean your friend's phone is the same as yours. It means you're making a call from your phone to your friend's phone. So keep those things distinct uh, and we'll be in good shape. 
So that wraps up what procedures are. A reuni reusable unit of code that is defined in a generic manner, can be called from multiple places, accepts parameters, and returns a return type optionally. So in our next video, we'll see how we can make a procedure. I look forward to seeing you there.